so um, continuing along the kind of theme of new types of platforms, so um, we've so far we've heard of POS and we've now heard from Ubiquity and now we're going to talk about F1000. And this is actually really more a platform, isn't it, than a yes. publisher. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of a slightly different perspective again. So I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Uh, Sabina Allen, who's going to talk about F1000 and yeah. transparency. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, so happy Open Access Week, everyone, like Brian said. Um, I think it's, it's amazing if you think about how far the open access movement has come in the last two decades. Um, and we're here now talking about issues that go beyond, far beyond um, just access itself. So this is something that, um, you know, the, the talk that I'm, uh, I've prepared is very much at the heart of what F1000 is trying to achieve, which is transparency overall. Um, so it's not just about researchers being able to access scientific content, it's actually being able to access um, the information behind um, that and actually be able to build on it as well. So we're very passionate about transparency. Um, we're transparent about our peer review processes. We're transparent about the discussions that arise between authors and reviewers. And we also um, strongly believe that all scientific research matters. It's not just the high impact papers that should be uh, published, it's, it should be all types of research outputs. And we very much designed our platform around that. Uh, so this is just a brief overview. Um, I'm going to talk about why we've decided to open up the peer review process. We do do it slightly differently to other open peer review journals. Um, we've removed editorial bias by focusing mainly on the fact that we think it's actually the researchers who should be deciding what should or shouldn't be published. It shouldn't be an editor who decides what is or isn't going to increase the impact factor of a given journal. Um, we've worked hard on improving how data is shared and on reducing research waste. And more recently, we've been working quite closely with funders and institutions to enable them to allow researchers that they are funding to publish using this model. So like I said at the beginning, the um, open access movement has come a very long way. I mean, there was a lot of activity before uh, the 2000s, obviously, but from 2000, we had major um, publishers now making um, open access journals available. And you can see that within the space of about five years or so, the um, open access content started to outstrip the non-open access content. And um, it's, it's growing all the time. Uh, there have been many major milestones in um, life sciences open access publishing. These are just some of my own sort of favorite points in time. This is not an exhaustive list at all. But as you can see, from about 2000, 2001 is really when the game changed. This is when Biomed Central uh, was founded. Uh, PubMed Central also opened up as an open access digital repository and PLOS One, uh, sorry, PLOS um, then also was founded. And so it suddenly became available, you know, lots and lots of different types of open access venues um, to publish this kind of content. Uh, following years, you know, lots of activity around licensing, around how we define open access, um, how we agree to share the content as long as there is attribution and so on and so forth. Um, how we moderate open access journals, audit them, for example, the um, DOAJ opened. And then funders started to get involved and started to mandate and encourage um, uh, publishing in open access venues, such as the Wellcome Trust and NIH. 2013, F1000 Research launched. So this is the first op open access post-publication peer review publishing platform. It's a bit of a mouthful. We don't just call ourselves a journal because we don't publish in the same way that journals do. Um, so I'll, I'll explain in a little bit more uh, detail later, but basically we are part preprint and then uh, part journal. So we publish the content first, which is uh, very similar to how preprints deal with content. And upon publication, the peer review process is triggered um, openly. And so to distinguish ourselves from journals, we call ourselves a platform. Um, we then started to work quite closely with funders such as the Wellcome Trust and um, the Gates Foundation. So Wellcome Trust last year opened their own publishing platform with us, which is called the Wellcome Open Research Platform. That's available to all funders that they, um, all researchers that they fund. Uh, this year we've opened the Gates Platform, which follows the same model as Wellcome. 
and just uh, this week we've opened one with HRB Ireland as well. So the funders are now really starting to get involved and say actually we, we like this model, we actually want to encourage everyone that we're funding to be able to publish all types of research output because then they, they are the ones covering the article processing charges, there's nothing else levied on the researchers themselves. So, like I said, you know, the open access is great. It's actually, you know, resolved issues about access to content, but the problems in scientific publishing are far bigger than just access. So, some of the common concerns that you hear, and this is something that, you know, I, I struggled with as well when I was a researcher, is, you know, you submit to a journal and you can spend many months you know, before you know what's going to happen to the paper. Um, there are a lot of delays. You might get bounced around between different journals. There are... Um, you know, you don't always get very clear decisions back from the editorial offices if they have rejected your paper. Um, there's limited access to data, so you know, as a reader or as a researcher who's trying to build upon the work of um, a paper or a group of papers that they're reading, they can't actually access the source data behind it to vet it for themselves. Um, there are various biases that in get introduced, and again, I've, I've mentioned the general impact factor, but that's not just that's not the only one, but. There are many biases that get introduced in terms of deciding what does or doesn't get published in a journal that goes beyond what the paper is actually about. And um, because there is this tendency for, for many journals to only select you know, the, the type of content that they think is actually going to draw in the most readers, it, oh, and also at the same time with researchers feeling that, well, okay, the results of my study aren't really that all that exciting. Why am I going to bother writing this up and submitting it? Because it's just going to get reje rejected from journals because maybe it's a null finding or it's confirming another study. The problem with taking that approach is that we start to get bias in what actually does get published. So we start, start having this selection process introduced, which isn't a, a true representation of what's going on in, in research. And this particularly impacts anyone who's conducting meta-studies like systematic reviews or meta-analyses, because then they, they're only getting access to the content that has been proven to work or is, is really, really interesting, and not actually all the other types of studies that are still relevant, but are actually showing the times that where it hasn't worked or, or, um, or, or has actually confirmed what has been shown in other papers. So there is research waste uh, for that reason as well, and this is something that we've uh, tried to address. And also there's a lot, of, um, a, a lot of cases where, you know, reviewers are doing a lot of this work and not really getting anything back in return. So some journals take the approach of saying, okay, well, we'll pay our reviewers. That's slightly problematic because how do you decide how much you pay and, and so on and so forth. Other publishers have come up with other models. Maybe they'll give them discounts or um, free subscription or, or so on and so forth. But we've tried to go one step further. We actually tr um, try to make it worth the review as well to actually you know, write a really good report on a paper. And we do this by allow, uh, publishing uh, the uh, reviewer's report with a DOI, so the report itself becomes citable. And the reviewers can actually add their own ORCID IDs onto their reports as well. So these reports become part of the literature. Um, one of the problems with uh, publishing is, of course, the peer review process. We had peer review week just a few weeks ago, and of course, everyone agrees that peer review is problematic, but no one can agree on what's the best way to actually conduct peer review. Um, and we all also agree that peer review at some level is needed. But the problems uh, that you know, often come up is that the peer review process can unfairly slow down the publishing process. You can get inconsistent uh, types of comments back from reviewers and editors, unclear decisions, lack of transparency about who, who are the people behind uh, the peer review. And also, you know, we hear sometimes that the more controversial or uh, different a paper is, the more difficult a ride it can have during the peer review process because it could be dependent on how open-minded that reviewer is in terms of uh, that particular paper. So can it block innovative ideas? Because of this, different journals have experimented with different types of peer review. So single-blinded is the most traditional format. This has been around since around the 1940s in, in a sort of a mainstream um, uh, type of way. Um, so this is where the uh, authors don't know who the reviewers are, but the reviewers know who the authors are. Uh, but because people aren't happy with that either, there are some journals who are experimenting with double-blind. So this is where only the editor knows 
who the reviewer and author is. The reviewer and author don't know who each other are. And so some journals like Nature Communications offer this as an option to authors. But this is also slightly problematic because there are uh, concerns about, you know, can the author truly remain blinded to the reviewers if, if it's, you know, if they're actually uh, building upon their own recent work. Collaborative peer review is something that we see uh, uh, eLife does particularly well. Uh, there's also Frontier, so this is where they're trying to move away from, you know, going back to authors with di lots of different sets of comments from reviewers without a clear direction about what should or shouldn't be done to the paper. So instead, the reviewers have a discussion amongst themselves along with the editor so they can go back to the authors with one single set of instructions about what to do. Um, and that's great, but it's not always scalable, which is why not all journals can actually adopt this model. And then you have Open Peer Review, which was spearheaded by the BMJ in around 2000. And so this is where the reviewer's identity is revealed. The authors know who the reviewer is. But to confuse matters further, there are many different types of open peer review. So some journals um, only keep it open during the peer review process so the author knows who the reviewer is and vice versa. Some journals go a step further and they actually let the reviewers see who, uh, so the readers see who the reviewers were. But they either do this by publishing the reviewer's name and not the report, or they publish the report and not the reviewer's name. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it can be a bit confusing. And then there are some journals like the uh, Biomed Central Medical Journals, which um, do full open peer review, which is where they publish any, any accepted article gets published with the pre-publication history as well. So you get the um, author's revisions, you get all of the stages of the reviewer's reports and so on and so forth. Um, BMJ does a, a mode of this as well. They publish, I believe, the editorial decision letter. So at F1000 Research, um, we also do open peer review, but we do this after publication. So the idea was that we don't want to slow down the, uh, the, st the stage at which the paper can be shared. So when a, when a paper is submitted, it does go through editorial checks to make sure it's, it's sound to the extent that we can see. Um, but at that point, as long as it doesn't actually um, have any major problems with it, it will get published. And as soon as it's published, the peer review process is triggered. So this is why we call it post-publication open peer review. So post-publication can also be used to refer to things like people commenting on social media and blogs and so on. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about invited formal peer review that's done after publication. So. Um, why do we do this? Well, this is because we wanted to put the authors in control of the process. So the authors can actually decide when they want to stop the peer review. So they can submit to us, and then it can be published immediately, and it will be, tra it will be refereed. So we ask the authors to suggest the reviewers. They do have to meet our um, suitability criteria, so if we check for things like are they collaborators and you know, do, you know, do they know each other in any way? Um, are they subject experts? And as long as they meet um, our criteria, they're invited and the review will be published pretty much as soon as it comes in. Uh, it, the review itself will also go through editorial checks uh, to make sure it's the right review for the right paper and the, the reviewers have given enough information. But the authors will then see it. And so the authors can actually decide at that point if they want to stop the rest of the reviewers being invited because they want to actually address the comments now or if they want the peer review process to continue. So we, we actually give the authors quite a lot of control in terms of the decision um, about what to do at what stage during the peer review process. Like I said before, the reviewers get recognition. They sign the reports. The reports are citable. Um, we don't actually um, make a decision based on how interesting or novel or groundbreaking a particular paper is. It just needs to be a scientific paper. Uh, sharing the data is mandatory for us. The only times that we waive uh, the need to share data is if there are legal or ethical implications like patient an anonymity and so on. Um, anything that passes peer review is then indexed, so you find it in the same way that you would with other content. And of course, it's gold open access. Uh, we, we do work quite hard to keep our article processing charges as low as possible. So um, the, uh, this is based on how long um, the article is. So a short article is about $150. 
and the longest article is about $1,000. But of course, like all other publishers, um, well, main publishers, we have waiver programs in place as well for anyone who um, can't afford that at all. So this just depicts what I've been talking about, just to make it a little bit clearer, because it is a fairly complex process. Um, so after the paper is submitted, the editorial team, the in-house editorial team, will do a lot of the usual checks that are done at most other journals. So we're looking for scope, language, is it clear? Have they adhered to the right reporting guidelines? Have they made data available? If not, why not? So we go back and forth with authors quite a lot about that. Do they have ethical approval? Um, we do plagiarism checks and all that kind of thing as well. Um, and like I said, we ask the reviewers, the authors to suggest reviewers, and at that point we check for reviewer suitability. So as long as it passes these checks, it will be published with a DOI. It's published as a version one. And at that point, all the readers, well, everyone can see it. It's, it's live um, and it's free to access. At the same time, reviewers are then invited. So the reviewers can see the paper as well. And we ask them to comment on things like the methods and analysis, uh, strength of conclu uh, conclusions, if it, is it scientifically valid, and so on. At that point, they also ask to provide a recommendation. So is it, do they approve with minor uh, reservations, or is it approved, or is it rejected? And the reason why it's important that they answer um, that particular question is because that influences whether or not the article has passed peer review and will then get indexed. So the reports, as I said, um, also receive a DOI, and the, read, uh, the author sees this as soon as it is uh, published, and the readers see it as soon as it's published as well. So sometimes we actually do see that, uh, especially if a paper has generated interest, it's getting reviewed, but also readers are commenting as well, and also adding their own, uh, their own thoughts to this particular paper, which authors can choose to take on board. So that just gives a... a uh, this actually shows what it looks like. So this is a paper that's been published, and on the right-hand panel you can see what the status of the peer review process is. And you, can't, you probably can't read it from where you are, but you'll see there's uh, three different, uh, just over here, there's three different versions. So this was the first version that was published um, 25th September, and at this point one reviewer had reviewed it and had come back with some minor comments. The author at that point chose to address the comments, so the author didn't have to wait for further reviewers to come in. So informed us, actually, we want to stop invite, further invites now, we want to address this. They addressed it, submitted a revised version on the 1st November, same reviewer then um, had reviewed and gave an approval. As a reader, you can click on these read reports and read the whole thing. And then at that point, because of obviously we need more than one reviewer, we need a minimum of two. Um, further reviewers were invited um, at version 2. And then you can see their recommendations. One still had minor reservations. The authors again chose to address that and submitted a version 3. And then both, uh, both of these two reviewers had reviewed it again and approved it. And so by, by this method, what happened is that the author made the um, paper available on 25th September by uh, mid-November, so this, so first of November, it actually passed peer review, but they still chose to make some further revisions. Uh, by mid-November, it was version three, and at this point, it's actually indexed as well. So it's quite quick. You know, I'm not saying every single paper has such a smooth ride. This is just obviously I've chosen a particularly good example. So in this particular case, um, uh, the readers can also actually see the whole thing that's going on at the same time. The versions also don't disappear. So version one remains, version two remains, version three remains. Um, they're all permanent articles. And when the article passes peer review, it passes peer review if at least two reviewers have approved or two have minor reservations or one have approved. At that point, it's sent to PubMed and Scopus. And also with PubMed Central, what happens, the article goes, all the versions go, and all the reviewer reports go as well. So even on PubMed Central, as a reader, you can access the entire thing. And of course, uh, if there's data, source data behind it, uh, readers can access the source data as well. So the um, other thing we focus on is making it possible for there to be an um, open discussion between the author and the reviewer. Um, so uh, this is because, you know, we, again, w we, do, we do step in. We do step in and advise authors when they ask us for advice. If they say, actually, how do you think I should answer this particular thing? But 
on the whole, what we're trying to do is within our system, so not, we're not saying have a separate discussion, you know, we're not saying go off and have a coffee together and talk about the paper. It has to be within, within the system transparently and the reviewers have to back up their own comments. So uh, the, top, uh, the top image there shows an example of a report, a reviewer's report that's published. The reports themselves um, have their own individual viewing figures, so you can actually see how many times this report itself as a separate entity has been viewed. And uh, the, the button over there says cite, um, and if you were to click on it, you actually get the citation details for that particular report. So these review reports are now formal documents as well uh, that are permanently linked to the actual research article. The author in this case uh, chose to respond immediately and they have to respond within our system and then as a reader you can see what they responded to, the reviewer can see it at the same time. In parallel you can have readers commenting, so this uh, example over there is a reader who's actually uh, was, not a f was not a formally invited reviewer but actually wanted to add um, his own points to the discussion which the author did actually respond to. So why do we make it this transparent? I'm not saying it's a smooth ride every single time, 100% of the time. But in general, uh, the reason we do this is because we want to make this whole process much more open to everyone. Uh, giving also reviewers credit um, for the amount of work that they do um, on the paper. And to trying to focus you know, the, the job of the reviewer to help the authors improve their work rather than um, sort of go back and forth with difference of opinion. <coughs> And like I said, we actually share the data behind papers and this, this is particularly important because in this particular example, uh, this is where a paper had actually passed peer review to begin with, uh, but then actually on social media, other people were trying to reproduce the study. This was a, a paper where they'd used some blockchain technology and some, uh, ec uh, some blockchain experts on social media were starting to you know, dig into the data and go, actually, we can't reproduce this. Um, and so we then got wind of it and then we went back to the reviewers and said well did you actually try to reproduce this in this particular case the first uh, the reviewers here hadn't and so then we had a discussion with the authors and we said we actually think we need to formally try and have this reproduced because this is the whole point of sharing the data the authors agreed and we then got another reviewer who was an expert in in that technology and obviously reviewers have to declare their competing interests as well and um, wrote a whole report on how uh, he had tried to reproduce the study and couldn't and on the basis of that uh, the reviewers uh, the authors agreed to retract the article so in that way we could work with the authors and the community to actually correct the literature and act, you know that's the whole point of us sharing all this information and for the authors as well um, making the data available actually does help the peer review process when the peer reviewer does proactively try to reproduce it as well. Of course, this can't be done for every single type of study. I'm talking about certain types of study where you can actually try and reproduce it. In this example, we had one reviewer who went, yep, yeah, it's fine, uh, I like it, but this reviewer from version one was raising issues and what uh, he was saying is I've, I've looked at the raw data I, c I can't get the results that you're getting so the author to give credit to him actually uh, tried tried to address it we had a version 2 the reviewer looked at it again still rejected it and then we had a uh, version 3 where he you know they, they were having a very frank discussion um, w which you can see all readers can see this on the paper so by version 3 the author himself stated in his comments that okay that's fine I appreciate um, what the reviewer has tried to do we have a difference of opinion and uh, now it's time to call it a day uh, so the author made the call himself it's I'm not going to put this I'm not going to do anything more to this and readers can actually just go through this themselves and make their own minds up um, at the same time this was really picked up on social media so we had a lot of people on Twitter and so on uh, who were commenting on this and actually saying that there were similar papers, for example, in PNAS that had found similar things, but they couldn't go and vet that for themselves. So it had actually uh, you know, raised a lot of discussion on social media as well about similar studies. So the reason that we have this is so that the referees can actually make the, the point of their review about trying to assess the soundness and the validity of it rather than just uh, going back and forth about difference of opinion. Um, like I said at the beginning, we also try and move away from editorial bias, so we try and actually encourage the publication of studies that are trying to reproduce other studies. So one 
recent example is obviously this famous one, uh, the stimulus triggered, well, the SAP, the SAP paper, I'm sure many of you know about this, um, that was published in Nature and a lot of people within the community, like uh, this editorial in science shows, were not able to reproduce this. We all, of, of course, later on found out that it was falsified data. Um, in F1000 research, one of the teams that was really leading the reproducibility studies was this Kenneth Ho Lee's lab. And so they submitted a paper to us where they tried to actually recreate the entire study. And of course, we, we welcomed that and they had to share their source data. So if in their paper, the source data was also reviewed by the reviewers and they, the reviewers agreed that um, the paper in F1000 research was sound and therefore it was believable that the, the STAP paper in Nature could not be reproduced. Uh, there was another example of someone who'd actually uh, first uh, uh, d basically recreated the entire study in the same setting, so went to the same labs and used the same reagents and so on, tried to reproduce it, and actually published first in BioArchive. Uh, we're absolutely fine with that. I know a lot of journals are absolutely fine with publishing preprints. We welcomed that submission to come to us. So then he uh, submitted to F1000 Research, again sharing the data. And in this case, of course, it got a full peer review. And that was just uh, another example of where that stat paper could not be reproduced. But the key thing was that here, um, we gave it space because we believed it was actually important to try and uh, give a space to papers that are reproducing uh, or trying to reproduce other studies or even confirm them. For this reason, we've got lots of different article types. So we have your typical research articles and, and so on, but we also have for like the smaller studies, research notes, uh, we publish case reports, we publish antibody validation studies, data notes, and these tend to be quite popular with authors because what we're trying to do is say, okay, fine, you, you know, we understand that there's going to be your big papers that you want to go and submit to you know, high uh, brand um, high impact journals that's fine but don't forget about the other supporting uh, data that you have that you can also still publish and uh, to complement your main study. So like I said we we launched in 2013 using this model since then we've had a lot of really great discussions with funders and also institutions so Welcome was the first one to come on board so um, so all of these platforms are run by the editorial team at F1000 Research, but it's only open uh, to their own uh, res uh, 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 so to their own fundies, basically. So uh, Welcome uh, Gates, which is um, launching with content at the beginning of November. Uh, we have another platform with UCL Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute has opened one with us as well. And like I said, this week we've just opened HRV Ireland. So um, we, the reason that the funders are actually working with us is because they can see the benefit of actually now uh, saying to the researchers that they're funding, you now have no excuse. You, they, you know, we're saying you can, you, know, you can publish your papers in all these other journals if they have an open access mandate, fine. But we also want you to now publish every type of research output that is going to be beneficial for you and for everyone else as well. And that's why we, we work with them as well to see if there's any other article types that we should be thinking of so that, you know, we're, we're trying to basically change the role of the publisher to facilitating the publication of the content rather than making a decision on what should or shouldn't be published. Um, so that's why we decided to change the system, but I kind of have a feeling I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll just skip through that and just go straight to the questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and you do a filtering for yeah. you know, all these conflicts of interest and these yeah. sorts of things. Are there cases where, where you feel the need to maybe step in and say, oh, this paper needs a, a statistical review or, one has, or this people of paper needs an ethical review or yeah. one hasn't been suggested? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, so uh, one of the things we're, we're trying to vet for is, as, as well as the spread. So if it's a multidisciplinary paper in particular, then we also say to the authors that you have to have reviewers who can actually assess each of these elements. The reviewers also have to state whether or not they've been able to look at the statistics. And so if they haven't, then we go back to the authors and say, actually, we, uh, we, can't, pass, we, we can't say this has passed peer review we need more recommendations, or we actually go to them and say, well, how about these people? Uh, so we'll recommend people to them as well. So, in, so we are actually watching that at the same time. I have a question about, yeah. um, about reproducibility. 
mm-hmm. um, about re- redoing um, yeah. uh, things and they're not being able to, to, to do it and yeah. they're publishing it. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's really more a question for uh, maybe Klaus or others. Do you have that sort of uh, publish that sort of material as well? Uh, reproduction studies, replication studies? Yeah. That haven't worked? Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. We, we, we publish uh, yeah, studies that may just be original mm-hmm. work. So, so for those ones, it has to be open uh, review, yeah, right? Uh-huh. So the yeah. authors are aware that when they get the critique back, it's it's you know, yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. I'm sort of wondering about the, the politics of it. Because I know I've spoken to researchers who said, well, I haven't been able to replicate that, but I don't dare say anything for career reasons. Have you, have you encountered that sort of experience? Yeah. Um, if it's if it's a particularly famous paper like the, in this case what happened the people who were actually trying to replicate it themselves were just as prominent as, th- as these researchers which is why they had no concerns about going head to head but in terms of um, authors uh, coming back to us and saying oh yes we couldn't actually reproduce this what, what they sometimes say is but we don't know if it's because we've just done it wrong or if it's because it truly is not reproducible so um, we have another format where, which is called the correspondence article, where they can actually raise their concerns by saying, you know, uh, whether if you know if they say that we haven't done the full study, we we've actually just tried X Y Z, so it doesn't warrant being like a full research paper in itself, but um, they are willing to actually put their name to it and say, could you actually um, look at what we've done? And then comment back, you know, in terms of why you think you, uh, we haven't been able to replicate it or not. Um, so some take that option up, um, and in those cases, we do the same thing. We'd actually go to the um, original authors, we'd let them know this has happened, and we actually want them to comment back again. But I, I think that the politics of it is always going to be an issue. So what we're, you know, we can't solve that. All we can do is actually just say, do you know what? If you want to write it up, there's a space for you to do this because. Uh, The other thing we hear a lot from researchers is that um, sometimes they just can't be bothered to write it up because they feel like no one's actually going to be interested. Um, So either it will get bounced back from the journal or no one will want to review it. And so I think like what PLOS One is doing, I think the BMC series uh, journals do this as well. And, you know, we're trying to do this as well is basically being more prominent about the fact that it's important to still publish this and we just need to change our mindset, you know, in terms of what is worth uh, uh, spending your time reviewing and writing up and what isn't. Because if it's, if it's a scientific study, it should be reported, right? <laughs> so. Yes, absolutely. So the funders have their own site, their own their own branding. It's their space. So the only th- so it's like having their own journal. Um, so their own logo, their own space. Uh, it's uh, so we we describe it as powered by F one thousand research because what it is is that they're uh, applying all of our editorial policies to the content. Um, it's the same editorial team that's vetting everything that's coming through. It's just that it's only open to the researchers that they have funded. So when anyone submits to those platforms, which they do through their, their submission system, uh, they have to state what the grant numbers are and so on. And then we just have to just verify that with, say, welcome and so on. Um, but then it's, it's all theirs. They have their own uh, DOIs and, and so on, their own branding, their own ETOX, for example. It's all separate. No, no, it's not mandated at all. So they, they, so with, uh, for example, Gates, they have mandated it has to be gold open access, but they're not telling you where you can or can't go as long as it's gold open access. And so the, it's the same with, with Welcome. They basically say, we're not forcing you to 
come to Welcome Open Research, but we're letting you know that this is an option. And so what we're seeing a lot of authors do is that they're sending their data notes or their method articles or their uh, study protocols and in that kind of thing. And we're also talking to them about, well, if you're funding them, then if it's a trial, then maybe we should be talking to them about uh, actually publishing the statistical analysis plan and you know that kind of thing. So it's more to provide the options to uh, publish this kind of content. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that was very exciting for them, actually. But they're, ver they're really behind it, and they've had a really good response from uh, their uh, grant holders. And we've had a lot of returning authors as well. So the ones who took that first step uh, to go, oh, what is this like scary new system that we have? Um, a lot of them have actually come back with more papers. So it's, it's been working quite well. Okay, what yeah, uh, one more oh, question. <laughs> How we handle that. Yeah. So, so what we do is we keep the authors informed. So if, if a, a review one has submitted their report, then we tell the author, uh, okay, you've got this report, but you've actually got two more coming in a week or two. Uh, we suggest you wait or, you know, unless you have reasons not to. So, the, so at least they know it's coming. The majority of authors will say, fine, we'll just wait. Uh, we want to see what everyone says. Um, occasionally, they come back and say, actually, no, that reviewer has raised a really good point. Can I just address this right now? Um, so, we, we, so, the, uh, so we're keeping them informed and like, giving them the option. But uh, I would say rough made up statistic is that about 90% of the authors will come back and say, we'll wait for all of them to come in. Yeah, exactly. And, and we encourage them to do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Sabina. No problem.